Good morning, Crossroads family. Why don't you stand with us this morning? This first song says, nothing can tear us from the grip of his mighty love. That's good news this morning, amen? It says his love is deep, it is wide, and it covers us. It is fierce, his love is strong, it is furious. His love is sweet, his love is wild. That love has changed our lives, amen? Let's sing to our Father this morning together. It's waking hearts to life. Your love is deep, your love is wide, and it covers us. Your love is fierce, your love is strong, and it's furious. Your love is sweet, your love is wild. It's waking hearts to life. Your love is deep, your love is wide, and it covers us. Love is fierce, and love is strong, and it's furious. Love is sweet, and love is wild, it's waking hearts alive. Love 
is deep and love is wild and it covers us. Love is fierce and love is strong and it's furious. Love is sweet and love is wild. It's waking hearts alive. Love is wide and it covers us. Love is fierce, love is strong and it's furious. Love is sweet, love is wild, it's waking hearts to life. Love is deep, your love is wide and it covers us. Your love is fierce, your love is strong and it's furious. Love is sweet, love is wild. And it's waking hearts to life. Amen, amen. Hallelujah, church. Good morning, Crossroads Community Church. How are you doing today? Are you excited to be in the house of the Lord? Amen, amen. That's awesome. Give the Lord some praise. And you guys may be seated for just a moment. As we continue on in our worship service, I'm going to ask Miss Maribel to come forward. Everybody say, hi, Maribel. And so... I'm going to let Pastor Lee talk here in just a second, but I just want to say a couple things because I have a microphone. And so she has went through the transformation class. She has went through the welcome experience. She has volunteered to serve. She signed up for our lay ministry track leadership course. And we are officially going to vote today to receive her into membership at this church, which is exciting as a member of the Church of Nazarene and, and the global body that we are. So, sir, it's all you, sir. Well, Mayor Bell. I'm not as uh, hyped up as Pastor Thomas, so I'm just relax a little bit. Um, you've chosen to become a member, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what membership is for everybody. Um, and the way I like to explain it is when I married my wife, I already loved her. And I had been for a long time, probably longer than she'd been loving me. But that's another story. It's another, another time when you talk about that. And... Uh, but the wedding was a public proclamation of my commitment to her, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer. You already love Christ. You already love the church. What today is about is your commitment to this local body, this local congregation. And you are, there, there's no benefit. You don't get 20% off at Subway or anything like that. Uh, what this is, is you're saying that you belong here and that this church belongs to you. And that you feel like this is where God wants you to heal, to grow, and to help others do the same. And so we encourage everybody to, to join the church, not just so you can have your name on a roll, but it is a public commitment on your part saying this is where God has called me to heal, to restore, to renew, but also to help others do the same. And so Maribel has already been active in, in uh, ministry and already been active. You've seen her as she comes through <coughs> the, with the greeters, with the smile on her face. She's on our uh, Leon Springs launch team and doing some great, great stuff. And so, Maribel, we have to vote on you. That's, that's the way we do it. I'm not sure why, but that's what we do. So, everybody who says, oh, yeah, let's let her in and say amen. Amen. All right. I'm pretty sure that was unanimous, right? So this certifies that Maribel Williams has been received into the full membership of Crossroads Community Church of the Nazarene. So there you go. Congratulations. All right. Good. All right. I didn't say you could go yet. I just, uh, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Hey, y'all stand up with me. <clears throat> David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let's go into the house of the Lord. Amen. And, uh, and even, even with COVID, we have uh, many folks that are sick. Uh, Carol Burton, Chris Stone coming to my mind. Stephen Santiago was back in church today after having been in the hospital. So we want to keep praying for all those that are sick and, and uh, just keep asking for the Lord's help in that. Amen. Uh, continue to pray for what's going on in the Middle East. Uh, we, we lost 10 of our sister churches in Haiti from this most recent earthquake. So there's a lot going on. 
for the, our Lord is an ever-present help in trouble. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, so let's, let's just prepare our hearts and begin to go into worship. We are here to exalt the name of Christ. So whether you're here in person, if you're online today, I encourage you not to share and like and all that stuff, but participate. Stand up with us. Worship there in your living room. Let the Holy Spirit move into your place and be a temple there. Heavenly Father, we give you ourselves today. We give you ourselves. We give you ourselves. The good and the bad. We give you the best parts of us and the worst. You are the God who cleanses us, who heals us, who restores us. So as we come together today and as we sing and exalt you, Lord, I pray that you would set your throne upon this congregation. Be our king today. We lift you up and we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, everybody said together, amen, amen. Let's worship, amen, amen. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore. This morning, there are people around the world that are hiding in caves because of what they believe. In these words, you give life. You bring light to the darkness. They have a totally different meaning to our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan right now that are running for their lives. But I want to 
want to draw attention. We need Jesus just as bad. We allow the enemy to, to get in and the, the lack of our need for physical things. There's a woman that's a pastor in Iran. She puts it in, in this way. She says, the United States is under a satanic lullaby. We've been lulled to sleep because we have AC, we have food, we have cars, we have clothes. But our spirits are just as depraved. Paul tells us there's nothing good in it. We need our Lord. But the church does well under persecution. So as our hearts are broken, let this be an encouragement. Jenny Allen told us there is a church of around 250 that over this past week while fleeing has grown to 3,000 of people chasing after Jesus. when they sing something like, it's your breath in our lungs. It's much more literal to them at this moment. Because God is probably the only reason they are still surviving. And so this morning as we raise, we raise this praise, it says all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. this as loud as we can for those that can't this morning. And we're going to focus on the part that says, these bones will sing for ourselves. Because how often have we take for, taken for granted the things that we have and allowed it to mask and stifle morning we're singing for those that can and at the same time we're having a heart of confession telling God I'm so sorry that I breathe the breath without you that I've gone a day with thinking I didn't need you and although there's tragedy around the world we can use it here and if these people in the face of death are growing in number, and yet the church in America is declining when we have all the freedom in the world. I just want to pray for these people real fast. Right where you stand, begin to lift these prayers for these brothers and sisters around the world. God, we come to you this morning, and we just want to lift up these people that are being persecuted to extents that we possibly cannot understand. As they are in literal physical needs this morning, hiding in the mountains, we pray to the God of miracles that you would provide things like we see in the Old Testament of manna coming from heaven. We ask that you would feed those that have not ate for days. We ask that your peace would invade those mountains in a way that they've never felt before. God, this morning we, we are sorry that we have not lived with the passion for you that we should. And we pray that no matter where we are in our walk this morning, that you would help us go one step farther this morning. tells us revivals are to come. We ask that this act of the enemy would come as his own downfall, as the courage and 
the boldness of those in Afghanistan standing up for you would encourage those around the world that are facing like circumstances every day. And that your spirit would begin to move across the world in a way it hasn't moved in a very long time. We ask that the enemy would be questioning why he even moved in this way because he has been attacked so hard as he is forced to retreat.
change where the old would go away and the new would come where everything would be different because they surrendered and submitted to your will not what they want lord but what you will in their lives that is our prayer today for your will to be done father we are excited to be in your house lord watch over us protect us guide us be with pastor lee as he brings the message and it's in jesus name we pray and everyone said together Amen, amen. You guys can be seated. Give the Lord some praise. There's a lot going on here at Crossroads. I want to encourage you to download the Church Center app. We have a short announcement video for you this morning.
First, I want to talk to you about is we are a multi-site campus. That is exciting and continuing and advancing. And we are growing. We have a campus here in San Antonio. We have a campus in Uvalde and here at Washington. It's going to be our place. And if you want to be a part of our launch team, go to the Church Center app and then sign up. Also, September 8th starts our next lay ministry class. We are excited to teach people what God has called them to do in ministry. So if you want to sign up for that class, go to the Church Center app. you got to get signed up before September 8th. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Well, I, I just want to clarify, Pastor Thomas said that I needed, I told him to not get as excited. I like his excitement. Amen. I like his excitement. I, I like uh, Zach and his passion and Thomas and, and uh, they, they add to our church family. Amen. And uh, my, all I was saying is I'm getting old, you know, that's all I'm saying, I'm getting old. Hey, when you walked in today, you should have received uh, one of these right here, all right? It's a big day prayer card, okay? And I want to take just a minute, and, uh, and I want to share with you my heart about this a little bit. Remember, I'm not very concerned whether or not we have a mega church or anything like that. What I am concerned is that each one of us is doing what God called us to do to minister to those around us. Amen? Wherever that is. We come here together. We are the church. When you leave, you're still the church. And uh, the Spirit of God's got to flow through you wherever you're at and whatever He wants you to do. Amen? And so <clears throat> what this is, I, I would like for you to write five names down of people you know who need the Lord. People you know that maybe they're a Christian, but they don't have a church home. They're not growing. Whatever it may be. Right now, find out. I'm not taking these from you. I'm not going to call these people. and Nothing like that. This is for you. You're going to take it home. But write down five names, and then I want you to put it on your refrigerator. Because if there's one thing our church knows how to do, it's eat, right? So I know you pass the refrigerator many, many times. So every time you see this, that's why it's in big, bold letters. Every time you see it, even if it's for five seconds, I want you to pray for these people, all right? Uh, we are called by God to love people, and uh, it's hard to love them if you're not praying for them. And so pray for them. Pray that God would bless them. Pray that God would help them. Uh, but then also pray that the Lord would give you an opportunity to invite them on this particular day, September 19th. And uh, 
the series that I'm going to be doing is called Bloodlines. So when you leave today, you're going to be getting a little card like this. It just has the name and the date, and this is for you to give to people when you invite them. You'll also get this in digital form. We'll be sending out a text that you can, you can share. Uh, some people are going to come on that day. The Lord's going to bless them. The Lord's going to touch them. And then they're going to go back to a church they hadn't been to in 10 years and not come here. We don't care. This is about transformation. It's about doing what God wants, right? And so if they want to go back to their church that they grew up in, that's, that's what it's about, okay? Some are going to come here, and the Lord's going to plant some seeds, and they are never going to grace the door of another church for 10 years, 20 years. But somewhere down the line, the seeds that we plant that day will be watered and come up, and God will do something great. Amen? <laughs> Praise the Lord. So I want you to take this or take the digital, invite people, uh, invite especially those that you're praying for, okay? And pray that their hearts would be open. The series is called Bloodlines. And if you have not noticed with everything going around, and, and we also want to remember the, the family of the Marines and the Afghans that were just, uh, you know, killed in this bombing last week. We want to keep all that in mind as we pray. But the world is getting more and more difficult. There's more and more tragedy happening all the time. We're getting further and further away from God. And my children's children and their children are going to be living in a world that I don't even recognize. And just like my grandparents and great-grandparents would have no idea what's going on here. I was visiting with the man just the other day, um, uh, yesterday, I think he was, I'm going to guess he was around 90 years old, and, and he said, you know what's wrong with the church today? And I said, what, what is it, sir? He said, all the kids got those little switchy, swatchy things, you know. He didn't know what it was, but I thought, yeah, it's a different world. And, uh, but the scripture says that there are blessings and curses that depending on how we live our life and how we pray, we can cause blessing and curses to go into our bloodline so it lasts longer than we do. And we're going to do one or the other. It's not like we won't do anything. We're either going to pass down blessing or pass down curses. And so this series is about how to live your life so that you pass down blessings in your bloodline so that when you're long gone, your family is still living according to the ways of God and enjoying that. And so it's, uh, I believe God has a powerful word for us on that day. And, uh, and so be here. And uh, it's a four-week series, so plan to be here all four weeks, but invite people to come with you. Tell them what service you're coming to. There's nothing worse than somebody coming and say, well, I'm waiting on so-and-so, and I already know they're not coming until later, right? And then it's a little awkward. So I say, well, sit by me on the front row, but they don't want to do that. So <clears throat> we don't want to do that. All right, let's pray as we get into the Word this morning. Lord, we thank you for your goodness, your grace, your love, your mercy. Open our hearts and our minds today and let us hear from you. We give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Everybody said together, amen, amen. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. Genesis 2, verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now let me pause right there for a minute. I want you to get a picture of the Garden of Eden. And so here is God and here is Adam. And he's got all the trees and everything is beautiful. And he's got, you know, every imaginable good fruit. You know, he's got the pomegranates and the pears and the apples. And, you know, I'm pretty sure there was a bluebell tree in there. And, and so all the good stuff is there, right? All the good stuff is there. And then God says, but here's this tree. And, and this tree can really mess everything up because I am your life, but if you eat from this tree, then death is going to enter into you, and it's going to cause separation, and we're not going to have the communion that I intended for us to have. So don't eat this tree. Whatever you do, do not eat this tree, right? Have, have you ever, you know, said to your, your little kid or your teenager, whatever you do, don't do this? And what do they do? They do it, right? And so look at the next thing that God says right after that in verse 18. So he says, don't eat this tree. And then he realizes, uh-oh, he's going to eat from that tree, so I better do something. In verse 18, the Lord God said, it ain't good for him to be all by himself. 
It's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Everybody say helper. In other words, he said, don't eat from the tree. And then he realized that he needs help to not eat from the tree. Right? We all need help. Right? Look at somebody next to you. Say, you need some help, brother. Right? Uh, we, we all need some help. Right? And, and we need help to not eat of the tree, to not partake of the forbidden fruit, to maintain our communion with God. We need help. Amen? And so he keeps going. He says, now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But no uh, suitable helper was found. So he brings all the animals in. The reason is because he's trying to find the perfect best helper to keep Adam from eating the tree. And, of course, we know eventually, and we'll go ahead and read it here, he makes woman. It says in, in verse 21, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib. He had taken out a man. He brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Amen. God in his nature, his essence, who he is, is community. Before God ever, ever made man, he was community all by himself. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Everybody say community with me. Community. So God is community. And so you have been made in his image, which means at the core of who you are, there is an innate sense that you want to be part of a community, that you want to be with somebody, that you want to be connected to people, that you want to belong to somebody, you want to have somebody, you can say, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. You want to have people around you. You want to be friends. One of the worst things that can happen to a human being is to be by themselves, to feel all alone, to feel like they don't have anybody. Because we have been made in the image of God, we have this, na this, this nature that I need to be connected to somebody. I am community. And so this is who I am. This is what I crave. This is what I want. And in the garden, they had this communion with God. And so God created me not to be my own community, but he created me to be in community with him. Amen? And so every single person, every single human being has this need to belong. Everybody say belong, to belong. We, we live in this weird little time where everybody's trying to tell us who we belong to. Trying to say, well, you belong to this group or you belong to that group. They say, well, if you're, if you're a white man, you belong to this group. If you're a black woman, you belong to this group. And if you're, you know, a man, a woman, sex, gender, politics, you belong here. And even when I am separated from God, I still have this need to belong. And so when somebody says, I want you to be part of our group, I, I, I affirm you that I am, I'm attracted to that. And so I move in that direction. And the problem is not all the messaging is good and not all the ways that I'm being pulled are holy and righteous and good. And many things that are pulling at me are pulling me the wrong direction. But when people call me and when people talk to me and people say, well, we want you to be a part of this. There, there is something inside of me that wants to be part. And so, you know, many times people wonder, why, why do people join gangs? You know, why do people get involved in a community of violence and rape and theft and all? It's because they don't have anywhere else to belong. They don't feel anywhere else connected, accepted, affirmed. There's so many people that feel lonely and anxious because they don't feel like they belong to their own family. They don't feel like they belong to a community. They don't have a church. They don't have a place. And, and they feel isolated. And, and, and so you have all these different messages that are going on. And when I'm not connected in the right place, then I will connect to the wrong. I cannot live my life in isolation, so if I'm not connected in the community that's leading me to God, I will inevitably be connected to a community that's leading me away from God. 
And, and so we see this in this sense of belonging and how the enemy begins to, to prey on this and, and begins to, to work on this. And, and I want to talk about this. So, so God puts Adam there and he says, I need to get him some help and we all need some help. And, and the, one of the messages in the Garden of Eden is that we need one another. And God is saying, if he's going to resist this, he needs somebody else to help him resist this. There are things that we go through that I don't have enough strength to handle on my own. I need my wife. I need my kids. I need my parents. I need friends. I need a, fam- I need a church. I need somebody that can pray for me. Somebody can help me. Somebody can speak some sense into me every now and then. Somebody that can help me when I'm down. The Bible says two are better than one because if you fall into a pit and don't have anybody to get you out, What's going to happen? But if you got somebody, and it says when you got three, then you become even stronger. So when we come together in community, that's where we are the strongest. That's where we get the most bold. That's when we begin to live in the spirit. But if you connect with the wrong community, then you get strong in the wrong way. And you get passionate about the wrong things. Amen? Amen. And sometimes our communion with God is not enough. So here we see God, and he, and he puts Adam there and says, don't eat from the tree. Let me give you a helper. And what the helper do? Lord, have mercy. What, what do you do when the people that are supposed to help you don't? What, what do you do when the ones that God gave you as a gift said they will be your helper and they lead you the wrong direction? How, how do you deal with that? How, how do you figure out, where am I supposed to be? Now, it is very interesting to me that when the serpent walked into the garden, walked, he crawled, whatever he did, all right? no, he's there, all right? He's there. It's not a theological thing. The devil's in there. The serpent's in there. He doesn't go up to Adam and Eve together. He doesn't say, Adam and Eve, y'all come together. I got something to tell you. He just goes to Eve. Now, Adam was right there because the Bible says Eve ate the fruit, and then she gave it to Adam, who was right there. That's what the Bible says, right? I don't know what he was doing. You know, maybe he was watching a football game, wasn't paying attention. I don't, I don't know what he was. Uh, you know how his husbands are. We're not always tuned in, right? I don't know what was going on. But he was right there. But the conversation was between Eve and the serpent. And so the purpose, what the enemy was trying to do was separate and discommune Adam and Eve from God to create this separation, this division. His goal was to get them out of communion with God. His methodology was to divide them from each other. Amen? Amen? When you look at the segmentation in our society, in our world right now, everybody's trying to divide us. Everybody's trying to pull us apart. It's happening on a very local level. It happens in your own family. You get somebody in your family that will gossip about your aunt or your uncle, and they'll come to you, and they'll tell you all kinds of stuff. Now you're in a pickle. Now you're in this place where I either got to keep a secret, I got to tell them, I got to let it all out, I gotta, but it puts you in this bad choice. So when the serpent went to Eve, and, and Eve ate the fruit, and then Eve says, here you go, where's Adam at? He's in a bad spot. Now he's either got to decide, I'm going to take my sense of belonging and bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, and I'm going to keep that, which is going to discommune me from God, or I can stay in community with God, but it's going to separate me from this woman, and I like her. So what do I do? And so there's all these different messages and, and things that are happening that are pulling me, and my sense of belonging can easily move me into the wrong community, doing the wrong thing, thinking the wrong way, feeling the wrong way, and suddenly I'm in discommunity with God. Y'all hear me? And everybody's trying to say, well, if you're in our group, this is how you have to act. And if you don't act this way, then you can't be part of our group. But if you're part of our group, then you have to hate that group. And if you don't hate that group, then you're not really part of us. It's happening in the church. Where the church is fighting with one another. Denominations have been fighting with each other for, for as long as they have existed over who's right and who's wrong. But this last year, we have really seen a, a lot of things where Christians have 
gotten into groups over COVID, over politics, over racism, over all this different kind of stuff, the police, all these different issues that have popped up. And, and what has happened is the segmentation within the church has said, well, I'm part of this group. And even though you're a Christian and we're supposed to be brothers and sisters because you don't see it my way, you're not part of my group. So I hate you and you hate me. And all this division has gotten into the church because, well, I think you ought to be six feet away from me and you need to give me a hug. Don't give me a hug, fist bump, shake my hand. I don't even know anymore. I just, hey, well, shake a little dance. What, how you doing? I don't know what to do, right? Whatever, right? But some people are getting mad. Well, I'm wearing a mask. Why aren't you wearing a mask? I got a vaccination. Why don't you get a vaccine? And, and we have all these things, and, and society around us is sending the message that if people don't do it the way we think they should do it, then somehow they're bad. And the serpent is still in the garden trying to divide because if he can divide us from each other, he can separate us from God. And what we've got to do is learn how to stick together. We've got to learn how to stick together. Amen? You all with me? I want to give you a couple of examples of this and how powerful it is. In Numbers chapter 14, we see Moses. Now think about Moses. Moses shows up in Egypt and he starts doing these miracles, Right? He starts raising his staff, and all of a sudden, flies and frogs and gnats, and the water turns to blood, and then finally, the death angel comes over. I mean, massive miracles that overtake an entire nation. And then they come out of Egypt, and they come up to the Red Sea, and he raises his staff, and the wind blows, and the water separates, and they go across on dry ground. I mean, if I am an Israelite following Moses, if Moses says it, I'm doing it. You know what I'm saying? Because I don't want fry. I don't, I don't want any flies in my house or gnats or frogs. I don't even like frogs. You know what I'm saying? They're ugly and they kind of stink a little bit. So I don't want, you know, so if Moses tells me, if he says jump, I'm jumping, right? And so here they come out and they're following him and everything is going good. They come up to the promised land and he says, this is the land of milk and honey. Everything we have been doing has been for this moment. We're going into a land that is going to be so wonderful, so blessed, so fruitful. You're not even going to believe it. And so they send spies over to figure out, do I go this way? Which way do I go? And they come back and they said, these guys are big. Verse 36 of Numbers chapter 14, so the men Moses had sent to explore the land who returned and made the whole community grumble. Everybody say grumble. I really want you to grasp this. A nation of over a million people destined to follow a miracle worker suddenly changes their mind because of 10 unknown, unimportant nobodies like that. A very small number of people controlling a message, and it changes the whole nation. It says they grumbled in their tents, which means they didn't, they didn't stand out on the, uh, you know, out in public and yell and scream about Moses. They went into their tents with just a few groups, and that's what happens. My sense of belonging, anytime my peace gets disturbed, anytime I wonder, you know, I don't know if this is going to be good. So they came back and said, these guys are huge, and they're fortified cities. We can't defeat them. And so my, their, their peace were, were, got disturbed a little bit. Anytime my peace is disturbed, I try to find stability in relationships. And what I do is I will gravitate to somebody that has the same fear that I do because I don't want to feel crazy. I don't want to feel like I'm the only one. So I'm going to try to find somebody that is just as nervous, just as angry, just as anxious, and I will group myself with them so that we can affirm one another, even if it's in the wrong direction. And so here you have an entire nation out of 10 men, and it slowly goes from 10 to 10 to 10, and little by little, people are just finding somebody that agrees with them, and it gets bigger and bigger until there is a tipping point, and they come back to Moses and say, we ain't going. We ain't going to do it. A small number of people controlling the messaging changes the nation. Let me give you another example. In Mark chapter 15, Jesus has been arrested 
Now remember just a few days before he was arrested, he came into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. And you remember what they did? Everybody went out with, with palm branches and, and they laid their cloaks out and they began to shout, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. They said, this is the Messiah. This is our deliverer. This is going to be our king and we're ready to follow him no matter what. And just a few days later, they are out there saying, crucify him, crucify him. What, what happened that everything changed so fast? How did, how did this group of people that had it right suddenly get it wrong? In Mark chapter 15, verse 9, Pilate is talking to the people. They brought Jesus to Pilate, wanted him to, to give him the death sentence. Pilate doesn't want to. His wife warned him not to mess with him. And, and so there is a custom to, to release one prisoner, so he gives them a choice. You can have Jesus or you can have a murderer named Barabbas. He says, do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews, asked Pilate, knowing it was out of self-interest that the chief priest had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd. And what they say, crucify, crucify. And the whole nation turned. The whole city turned. The chief priests, this is a small group of people. They did it in the middle of the darkness so that they wouldn't have to deal with big crowds and they just got a few people and they say, you tell a lie, you tell a lie and we'll get everybody believing this and by the time the city woke up, everything had begun to change and everybody was wondering what was going on and their peace was disturbed. How can this man that we worship now be arrested? And they begin to, to, to wonder how, what, what's going on and the anxiousness, they begin to look for other people to join in with and it began to spread and the next thing you know, the whole city is against Christ. How does it change so fast? And it's easy for it to happen. Amen? Are y'all with me today? Who moves you? What messages determine your direction? You know, what do we do? We, we look on social media and we say, well, you know, it says this on Facebook. We don't go to check it out, see if it's true. We don't do any research. We just read it, and all of a sudden, we're mad. We're mad. Britney Spears still can't get free. I'm mad about it. You know, and, and all of a sudden, we have all this emotion and everything, and we get all stirred up. And, and with social media, it's the same thing that was happening back then. It's just faster and quicker and it's little groups here and there, and they say it goes viral. That, that doesn't mean it went to everybody. It means it went to little, just a few different people, and it kept getting bigger and bigger, and then boom, all of a sudden, something has taken off. And, and we get all wrapped up in what we see, and we think, well, if it's on Facebook, it must be true. And, and, and we get all that stuff, and we are being pulled in directions that are not necessarily righteous and good, even if it's coming from somebody who should be our helper. And there are times when my helper is giving me messages, whether it be this group or that group, somebody that, that I trust to help me move in the right direction, but the message they're giving me that they're delivering is leading me the wrong direction because they have gotten off, they have become Eve, and they are supposed to help me, but instead they're leading me the wrong direction. I'm not checking it out, but I feel what they feel, and so I jump in there, and the next thing you know, I'm off, and I'm gone. You hear what I'm saying? So how do we deal with this? Matthew chapter 18. I want to walk through this a little bit. Matthew chapter 18, 1 through 20. It says, at that time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? So that's, the, that's setting up the conversation. So Jesus called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of God. Therefore, whoever takes... The lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, and whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. So he, he's saying, how, how do I get into the kingdom? I become like a child. I believe with blind faith. When my children were young and I said, we're going to go get some lunch, they didn't say, mm, I don't know if he's going to feed me or not. They knew I'd been feeding them their whole life, so they just trusted me, right? They just trusted me. And, and so he's saying, if you're going to come into the kingdom, you have to have this blind faith. You have to have this trust. Well, the nature of that trust then makes me vulnerable to what else Christ taught, which is that in the church there are wolves in sheep's clothing. 
And so in the church, this can begin to happen just like it did in the Garden of Eden where our helper is not helping us go the right direction, but our helper is fooling us with the wrong message, and it can get all mixed up and all discombobulated. I said that word because my dad's here. That's his word, discombobulated. Verse 6, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. If your hand or foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your hand, eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fires of hell. And he's speaking in hyperbole, but he's saying if something causes you to sin, get rid of it. Verse 10, see that you do not despise one of the little ones. Christians, these aren't children, these are me and you. We have come in by faith, believe in what God has said, trust in the church. Amen? People come into this building and I start talking, they don't know anything about me. And God says, trust. Which makes this position very powerful. And when someone comes to you and says, you're a Christian, I need for you to pray, I need for you to give me guidance, I need for you to help me because you know more than I do, that makes you very powerful in their life. And we got to make sure that we're being moved by the right message. He says in verse 12, what do you think if a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go look for the one that has wandered off? In other words, every one of these little ones is important. And if he finds it, I, truly t I tell you truly, he is happier about that one sheep than about the 99 that did wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. And so, with all that being said, here it is in verse 15. If your brother or sister sins, if one of these little ones has gotten off and they started worshiping something weird, they started saying Elvis is God and Bluebell is the Holy Spirit, whatever, you know, if they get off... If they start holding a grudge, they won't forgive. They start doing things they shouldn't be doing. They go off in a lifestyle. What does it say? It says, go and point out their fault just between you and them. Adam and Eve. Adam didn't do it. Adam listened, heard it, didn't do anything. He was right there. So you go and you talk to them. It says, but if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. He's bringing up in Deuteronomy the law that nobody could be convicted by one witness. There had to be at least two or three witnesses. So now he's saying, you got a brother or sister who is living in sin. Go to them and point it out. If they don't listen, bring back two or three witnesses, and you do this. But then he goes on, he says, where two or more gathered together in his name that he is there with us. And so he's saying, when you come together with that, you need to be seeking God, praying together, and finding out what is true. What is true? Because whatever the sin is, if they sinned against you, then you may have this, this prejudice against them. You may think, well, that's how they think. That's what. And sometimes what I think is a sin is not a sin. I just got something wrong in my mind. So just because I come to you and say, hey, brother, you're going the wrong direction, maybe I need to learn something. And so sometimes one-on-one -on -one is not enough, so you've got to bring two or three together. Amen? Now look what it says after that. It says, but if they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen, even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Here's a process. you got a brother or sister going away. They were trusting. They were taught to trust. They heard the wrong message. They went the wrong direction. You talked to them. It didn't work. You brought two or three witnesses. It didn't work. Now bring them before the church and come in my name. Don't show up and say, I'm a Christian, but be judgmental. Don't show up as a Christian, but be condemning. Don't show up as a Christian, a Christian and, and throw a guilt trip. Show up and say, we need to pray. 
We need to pray. And what he's saying here is the institution of the church then is where you come when you have gotten off. And even if somebody's led you the wrong way, you've heard the wrong message, you've gotten the wrong group, when you come back together in the church and seek God, the power of the Holy Spirit binds what needs to be bound and looses what needs to be loosed so that in the church and through the church, we are set free from all the junk of life. Amen? Praise the Lord. So what happens, what happens when I disconnect from the church? And why the church? You see, it's very easy for a Christian brother or sister to go the wrong direction. Amen? Can we, can we get an amen? Is it just me and Nancy? Me and Nancy are the only one I'm guilty. And it's easy for us to get on the wrong side of something. On the opposite side of Jesus on something. Amen? It's easy to be judgment. It's easy to do that. It's easy for one Christian to go the wrong direction. It's even easy for a group within the church to go the wrong direction. And you can get groups. That's why we have church splits. That's why churches start fighting with each other. That's why you have board meetings where everybody's yelling and screaming. That's why all that kind of stuff happens because even in the church, even in the Garden of Eden, we don't always go to God and say, help us with this. We just cause trouble and we judge and we condemn and we do all that kind of stuff and we get divided. But when we come to church, we ought to be asking God, just help us find the truth. And so this process, the Apostle Paul is saying, when you do this, the purpose is to maintain unity and for restoration, to get everybody on the same page, to get unified with the Spirit. So in other words, even though one person can stray, a group can stray, a whole congregation can stray. If you were alive long enough, you know about Jim Jones and how he was a, a righteous preacher, and he got off, and he led people down to South America. They all committed suicide. We had David Koresh in, in, in Waco. It is easy for one person. You got some preachers that are leading people down some weird paths that are on TV and everything else right now. So a congregation can move, a preacher can move, a Christian can move, groups can move, but the church... cannot be defeated... Upon this rock I will build my church, and not even the gates of hell shall prevail against it. What is he teaching us here? He's saying that one person can get the wrong message and change. A group can get the wrong message and change. A congregation can get the wrong message and change. But the church universal, our brothers and sisters all around the world, it is hard to move all of them the wrong direction. And so as long as I'm connected to the church, if I get the wrong message in here and even get a little bit straight, as long as I stay connected to the church, there's going to be more people going the right direction in the church than going the wrong direction. So the church becomes the place where I am washed and cleansed of the miscommunication. I'm washed and cleansed of the untruths. I'm washed and cleansed of all the junk that people are trying to tell me I should feel and be and say. Amen? And do not sit here and, and, and get in your mind, oh, he's being political and it's about, no, no, no. I'm talking about anything. This, this has been going on since the church was born. And, and, and we get off. And so the church becomes this, this place. Jesus said, I'm the groom and you are the bride. And I'm going to cleanse you with the washing, with the word, to present you to my Father, holy and blameless. And so when the church becomes a church and we quit fighting with each other, and when we disagree with us, Lord, you show us. And until he shows us, we set those things aside and just love one another. Amen? And we stay unified. We stay connected to the church. The worst thing you can do is get disconnected from the church. The worst thing you can do is listen to me and nobody else. Lord have mercy. We're the body. And, and what he's saying is, I'm going to wash you and cleanse you and refresh you. In Ezekiel, he talks about the church in, the, in, the, in a vision of the temple. And he says, out of the temple comes a river that flows, and as it flows, it gets deeper and deeper, and people walk in it, and they're refreshed. It reminds me when we used to live 
kind of up in uh, the mountains in Las Vegas, New Mexico, and we'd go up there, and there'd be these beautiful rivers coming down the mountain, clear water, cool water. And, and as a kid, I would just play in a very serene, very peaceful. Remember, Jesus said to the woman, if you drink from the water I give you, then rivers of life will flow out of you. The devil wants to get us separated from God by getting us separated from each other. And the way we avoid this, stay in the church. Stick to the church. Be in church. And I'm not talking about crossroads. I'm talking about the church universal. Crossroads is part of that. But I'm saying be in the church. The worst thing you can do, I've seen it so many times. People get disconnected from the church. They stop going to church, and the enemy gets in between. And suddenly you got problems in the marriage. you got problems in, in parenting. you got problems with parent. you got all kinds of issues. And some people are in the church, but they're not part of the church. And so this happens in the church sometimes because we come here, but we don't, we don't have a sense of belonging to the church. The, the church is supposed to be the body, so every part matters. So every part of my body is contributing to the health of every other part of my body. So if you come here and you say, give me, give me, give me, I need some spiritual refreshment, but you don't go out and try to refresh anybody else, then you don't, you're not going to have a sense of belonging. It's going to be like a place where you visit, you get something, and you leave. It's like going to a steakhouse where you don't know anybody. The meal was good, but it's much better going to grandma's house where there's a lot of laughter and a lot of love, and you get to watch the Cowboys lose again. Right? You bond over that. You cry and you weep and you bond. <laughs> We're supposed to be a refreshing river, not a tributary, not streams off here and there but one solid, refreshing river. And the enemy wants to put rocks in the way and divide us up, stick to the church, love the church, let it be the place where you get your head on straight. And as brothers and sisters, we help each other to see the truth, to find the truth, and to live the truth. Amen? Stand up with me and let's, let's yeah, we can give the Lord a praise offering for that. Amen? Amen? As we sing this next song, and I know I've gone late, but the Cowboys aren't losing today. Um, the river. I want you to see that. I want you to get Ezekiel's mind, the temple of God, and out of it is running this beautiful, refreshing river. And what we're saying is come to the river. Come to the river. Praise his name.
Anyone that has questions about lifelines, I'll be down here to answer any of those questions, no matter what they may be. If you got questions about small groups, come talk to me. No matter what they be.